Right, so this video is going to run through um, the uh, one of the papers from the AQA uh, AS specification. It's going to go through the June 2013 paper, um, which was sat on Tuesday the 4th, interestingly. Um, and I'm going to go through it start to finish, um, basically sort of work through what the mark scheme would do, but also maybe like sort of little hints, tricks that you would, uh, following should, should give you the better chance of getting sort of more marks on questions and all the rest of it. So... Let's start. So obviously, usual front page and the rest. Fill it in if you're in an exam. All this blah 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 blah. Hour and 45 minute paper. It's the longer of the two. Uh, this is the hundred marker one here, which you can see versus uh, 70. I think it is for for Chem one. So a bit longer, around 45 minutes. Uh, roughly a minute and a mark. You actually get slightly more. You get an extra five minutes um, than that. So without further ado, let's start. So first question here. The first question we're looking at is a question about equilibria. Um, namely, sulfuric, ac and, uh, sulfuric acid. Um, I hate they spell it with an F. It kills me. Uh, and the fact that we can use this contact process as the manufacturer process. There's no equilibrium sign in here. That's really odd. That should be there. No idea where that's gone. But there you go. So we react sulfur dioxide with oxygen, half a, a mole of oxygen, and we end up with this thing, sulfur trioxide. And it's asking us to, and we're given a, an enthalpy value for this, which, if we just ignore the question right now, Negative enthalpy change tells me I've got an exothermic reaction here I'm dealing with. Exothermic. That's very important because without that information, the actual question, which I can see is here, just isn't going to get answered correctly. So state and explain the effect of a decrease in temperature on the equilibrium yield of SO3 in particular. So we're talking about this guy here. When I decrease the temperature, what happens to the yield, the amount of this? Okay, The equilibrium yield, the amount. So first thing, I'm assuming that with all these questions, you've got a base level uh, of understanding. If you haven't, go and look at some of the other videos, read some books, notes, whatever. So decrease temperature. When we decrease temperature, the equilibrium through Le Chatelier's principle, it's going to look to undo that. So it's going to try and increase temperature. It's going to do that by favoring the exothermic reaction. Well, from the enthalpy change, the forward reaction is exothermic, therefore... Uh, decrease temperature is going to favour this reaction here. The equilibrium position is going to shift to the right, so over this direction, therefore producing more SO3. So what's going to happen uh, to the yield of SO3? Well, it's going to increase. Fairly good starting place there. So we're going to increase. We've got self one mark just for that alone. Explanation. Well, this is the important bit now, and it's it's basically what I've just said. So forward reaction is and I'll abbreviate things, it's exothermic. Um and what we find and this is very important on the equilibrium question, this next mark is incredibly important. So the equilibrium position shifts right. That's not going to get you the mark, it's this next bit as well. Um and in this case, and it all depends on the question, uh to oppose the oh, decrease in temperature. Basic statement here of what happens, the effect, explanation, so we've got this forward reaction, it's this key phrase here, every single equilibrium, equilibrium question I've come across has this particular end part, so the equilibrium position shifts to the right or the left, that's the easy part, and it's this final bit, to oppose the decrease in temperature, or to oppose the uh, in increase in pressure, whatever it be, you fit that to the question. Give two feats of reaction at equilibrium. This is a nice one as well. Um, but a trick, because there's, there's, a, there's a couple of words people always miss out, and that's that the forward reaction rate equals backwards reaction rate. Note those words there. We've got rate in capitals. If you don't put rate in, Forward reaction equals back reactions, you're not going to give the marks. The other one, that's this, this idea of a, uh, a dynamic equilibrium, that there's two reactions going on, but at equal rates. That's the, that's the important thing. So the term dynamic is not going to get you any, uh, any marks for that, but it's, it's, that's where this term dynamic comes from. Uh, feature two, concentrations uh, remain constant. And of course, we're talking about concentrations of the reactants and the products, which you could state, but you don't need to. Uh, so concentrations remain constant. 
Okay, not amount, man. Not amount of reactants remains constant. It's the concentration specifically. And so we're five marks into the paper. Not a bad start. So write an equation for the reaction of concentrated sulfuric acid with potassium bromide to form potassium hydrogen sulfate and hydrogen bromide. It's kind of one of those you're just going to have to sort of really, really write down. So you should know potassium bromide is that, and of course you should know sulfuric acid is that. If you don't, this really is no helping you. Um, potassium, we know potassium hydrogen sulfate, you can probably work out, it's H and we've got an SO4, and hydrogen bromide again, HBr. In terms of working out which is which, it's really, you can use the charge, you can use the fact that the SO4, 2 minus, then you've got the H plus, and therefore you need the two of those, and that's where it comes from, the H2SO4. Similar concept here, we've got the SO4, 2 minus, but the H plus, which means overall, this guy, the HSO4, is minus, therefore 1K. If you really struggle with this, leave it. Don't spend hours on it. It's worth one mark. Next one. Bromine is one of the products formed when concentrated sulfuric acid reacts with hydrogen bromine. Right, so what we're doing here, they've gone from an equilibrium question, uh, and they've now shifted into talking about um, halogens, basically. And that's that's... It's kind of the nature of some of these. Don't think of them as just distinct topics. Bam, bam, bam. They are mixed across. So we are looking at the reaction of sulfuric acid. So again, H2SO4 with hydrogen bromide, HBr. Um, we know we're going to form bromine, so fine. Uh, and the other thing is going to be SO2 and H2O. Balancing this up with a 2 there and a 2 uh, there. This is one of those equations, really, you sort of just need to know. It's part of the halogens topic. There's there's a video for that if you want to check it out. Um, have a look at it, but you just need to basically get your head around that. Role of sulfuric acid. Normally, we talk about the reducing power. Uh, we talk about the, the bromide here. It's flipping it. It's asking us, what's the role of the sulfuric acid? Uh, well, it's the opposite then. It's the oxidizing agent. So the bromide here is, is the reducing agent, is reducing, but therefore the, the sulfuric acid is the oxidizing agent. And you could look at the um, the oxidation numbers here and, and see what we've got. So we would have plus 6 here, I believe, yeah, minus 8, yeah, plus 6. Uh, and here we would have blah, 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 plus 4. So we know that the sulfuric acid, it's or the sulfur within the sulfuric acid, it's uh, causing the uh, the oxidation number is going down, therefore it's being reduced. Therefore, an oxidising agent is itself reduced, and we could we could link that into the idea of the uh, the bromine here going from minus one uh, to zero. So that is being oxidised by the sulfuric acid. Either of those sort of hopefully explains that a little bit. Oh, my favourite mechanisms. See this? They're throwing all sorts of stuff in. This is question one, <laughs> and we've had halogens, we've had equilibrium, and now we've got a mechanism as well. Um, but mechanisms are a really easy way to get marks. I mean, there's how many marks? There's five marks. It's an absolute gift. So stage one of this conversion is this one here. It's the reaction of H2SO4. Now, it's one of those you just need to know, and this is an example of an electrophilic addition reaction. One of the easy ways to think that we've got a... Uh, an alkene here, we've got a double bond present, that's what I was looking for, double bond. We add across the double bond and uh, that's just, just really sort of a key um, characteristic of the electrophilic addition reaction, the fact that we're reacting uh, with an alkene initially. H2SO4, so let's draw our initial molecule. So what we've got, we've got uh, CH32, so CH32, Double bond there, nice and clear. That's my molecule here, this molecule here, and I'm going to react H2SO4 with it. A tricky one here is that you need to normally be able to draw this kind of reasonably well. We've got the HO part, um, S, and then we have this OH here, so H2SO4. It's a bit of a tricky one to draw, really. It's just getting your head around it. Obviously, I've expanded the OH group this side because that's obviously a key step um, because I'm going to have my first arrow going from there to there. Remember, it's electrophilic, therefore it's it's going from here to my um, uh, electrophile. Uh, I Next step, miles weather, a little bit bigger. Move on to there. This is a pair of electrons, must be double headed arrows in this case. We're looking for the next stage here to be drawn. We don't need to draw a final product at all. 
um, but what we do need is of course the draw this in the correct position this is the important bit um, recently I had a question where people were adding a different example of it I think it was hydrogen bromide um, but they were adding things into the wrong place um, what they'd written was was correct for a different molecule given so we know that we're going to end up with a CH3 group on the end so oh, no we're not hold on so we know we're going to form this CH3 group on the end so this hydrogen here must be adding on to this end carbon so we had two hydrogens before we've now got three meaning that this is our positive portion um, and the final bit of the molecule that's left here we've got an oxygen here with a lone pair because it had those electrons moved onto it uh, and the rest of the molecule which at this point you can just uh, just abbreviate down like that now we have these electrons moving onto this note that it comes really from those electrons to where it needs to go don't be sloppy with your arrows you'll lose marks okay marks here are four uh, one two three the structure four and then the arrow five five actually quite easy marks probably the most difficult electrophilic addition question you're going to get because it's the uh, the sulfuric acid but provided you know what you're doing and you've done your revision that's that's actually a gift an easy five marks to reduce the type of reaction in stage two of this conversion so stage two is this bit here uh, what we've got is we are adding water to a substance and we're form forming uh, two products so what we've got here is an example of a hydrolysis reaction um, state the overall real role of sulfuric acid in this conversion very very important here look it starts here and ends so actually over the both equations here uh, the sulfuric acid remains constant therefore it is a catalyst 16 marks 16 percent of your paper is in question one alone <laughs> gonna crack on uh, I reckon we've probably got what five questions in total how many have we got oh no 11 it would seem wow how is that gonna work um, anyway we'll soon see so going on then question two uh, following pairs of compounds can be distinguished by simple test tube reactions oh, I like these that's basically what you're gonna react it with what you're gonna see good first one maybe a reason tricky one again tying into halogens the fact that we've got the iodide versus the bromide so what could you add there's two well there's two ways of doing this I probably would go for if I'm honest which one would I go for here what would I go for yeah I would assume that it would be when you do the halide test um, you end up with precipitates you'd end up with a cream precipitate of silver bromide and a yellow precipitate of silver iodide there is a further test besides the colors to confirm which is which and you can add concentrated ammonia solution and what you find out is that with the bromide the cream this well the the solid um, also precipitate dissolves however with the iodide precipitate remains there is another option you could use sulfuric acid here and you could look at what's produced so sulfuric acid there concentrate sulfuric acid um, another option depends how comfortable you are I think that's more of a difficult one to work out with these observations personally I think anyway um, we would get orange fumes and all the rest of it from the production of bromine down here uh, we would have black solid um, or you could say purple vapor either of those is referring to the fact that we've got iodine produced I think this is a better one to go for but it's slightly different because you've already produced the precipitate um, you're not actually testing to see if it has those particular ions, the halide ions in it how can we tell the difference between hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid and nitric acid similar actually to the one before the halide one this time we are testing for the fact that this has the chloride ion in it so we're going to use silver nitrate could write it as a formula or in words observation white PPT white precipitate um, no visible change we'll go for no visible change um, 
no reaction. That says no, not mo, but there we go. Uh, another one, cyclohexane and cyclohexene. Right, the term cyclo might make you think, oh, I don't know what's happening, but it doesn't matter because it's still the fact that we've got an E and an A. So we've got an alkane and we've got an alkene. That's key thing. Straight away, you should be thinking, and th these should be easy marks here. I mean, you've got nine marks. I mean, that's actually ridiculous. That's, that's giving them away. Nine marks for a few little observations. So bromine water, cyclohexane. Don't get these confused. Ene is down the bottom. This is going to go colourless. And I would say here, remains orange would probably be my, my shout on that one. There are other options. I'm not going to go down them. Look at the mark scheme if you want. There's all various other things you can use. That's the one really that's the easiest one, I think, to get. Oh, there's more. <coughs> not finished yet. Butanal. So aldehyde. Butanone, ketone, bio means write on your papers as well, you can do what you want. It says do not write outside this box, really, if you do, no one's going to no gonna die. Uh, your answer should be within this box though, because that's what they'll be scanning and all the rest and marking. Reagent, classic, probably my favourite test um, would be this old guy, Tolland's reagent, observation with butanol, <laughs> aldehyde, it can be further oxidised, and that's what happens in this reaction. <coughs> Excuse me, just thought I'd cough then. Uh, the Tollens reagent is actually oxidising the aldehyde and itself is reduced, and we find that really simply silver ions become silver metal, and that's what you get when you see the silver mirror. Uh, and say here again, uh, no reaction stays colourless. Either of those would be fine. I mean, look at this. Question two now. We're 28 marks into the paper. That's almost a third of the way into the paper. And we've been working for what? Sort of like... That's clearly not 28 seconds. 17 minutes? So, I mean, I've gone at a reasonable pace. But actually, you know, you, you, you now should be 10 minutes ahead of where... Kind of, well, certainly 10 minutes away, ahead of where we should be. So, uh, question three. Question about kinetics. Nice, easy question. This comes up as question three. Sometimes comes up earlier in the paper. Doesn't really matter. Either way, uh, quite nice energy. Uh, quite nice energy. Just seen energy there. Quite nice questions to get. On the appropriate axis of this diagram, mark the value of EMP for this distribution. So we're looking for the most probable value for the energy of the molecules. Therefore, it's got to be on this axis because this is the energy. If you put it on this axis, then you're just wasting time. I mean, what are you doing? Number of molecules. So it's the most probable. Well, the most probable is the one that's clearly at the top here. So we're looking at... Um, but I'd draw a little nice little... Probably a straight line would help. He's most probable there. And that's going to be one mark on this one. There's another part as well. On this diagram, sketch a new distribution for the same sample of gas at a lower temperature. <laughs> okay. What they've done is they've gone lower here. They often go higher. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to move up slightly. Uh, lower means we're going to shift the whole thing this way. We're going to have more molecules uh, at a lower energy. Therefore, we're going to go up. Oh, and then we're going to drop down. Key thing is we're going to come under. Oh, God. Ideally not touching that line. That's really ideal. Um, in fact, actually, you'd lose. You would actually lose the mark for that. Let's let's start that again. Do a better line. So, key thing is, it's going up higher than the original. It's coming down. Oh, 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 oh. oh nailed it. Not really nailed it there very much, but there you go. Shifted this way, we can see now more molecules. Uh, most probable energy is now at a lower position than it was before. Kind of makes sense. These before were the molecules that could react. Now, obviously, we're just dealing with this bit under here, which makes sense. You drop the temperature, you drop the energy the particles have. Therefore, they're more they're less likely to have the activation energy when they collide. Boom! Three marks. That is a dream. Absolute dream. And um, there's a couple of things. This should only cross this once. They're very pedantic about this. It goes up higher. Crosses once, does not touch the axis or the other curve at any other point. Fairly key. Just just don't mess it up, basically. Why does a decrease in temperature decrease the rate of comp decomposition of this gas? So it's actually what I said before. So now we can see here, this line, lower than before. That means the number of molecules now with the activation energy is lower. So let's put that into words. So there is a... Um, fewer or less molecules 
uh, with uh, the required oh, I should have just written EA there we go activation energy it's your first mark so what's happening there's fewer molecules with that what's that so kind of what the explain here therefore some sort of connective um, fewer successful I like the word successful in this context fewer successful collisions so fewer molecules with required activation energy because we've dropped that doesn't no that's that's wrong ignore this fewer molecules with Oh, I know what I want to say, and now I cut my word, it's really bad. Fewer molecules with energy equal or greater. Oh, that's horrible. Fewer molecules with energy equal or greater than. That was pretty sloppy there for me. I completely forgot. Obviously, the it might have worked before. I like this one better though. Fewer molecules with energy equal or greater than the required activation energy, therefore fewer successful collisions. That little triangle meaning therefore if you don't know. And see now we get into really small questions. Five marks for question three there. Question four. <laughs> Extraction of metal, I would guess, on this one. Or possibly not. <laughs> uh, yeah some sort of metally extraction one. So the price of copper is increasing as supplies of high-grade ores start to run out. The mineral covalite CUS found in low-grade ores is a possible future source of copper. Yada, 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 yada. Uh, when we extract it, where reaction occurs between copper sulfide and nitric acid to form a dilute solution of copper sulfate. Oh, you're on, sorry. Basically, balance the equation for this first one. So standard balancing equation, worth one mark. If you can't balance equations, uh, don't spend a thousand years on this because it's not worth it there's a minute of your time if you're really good at balancing equations boom get it done uh, give the oxidation state of nitrogen each of the following so HNO3 we've got a position where it is minus six there plus one therefore it's got to be plus five to get the overall thing back up to zero again I'm assuming you understand how this works uh, NO is going to be plus 2 because oxygen is minus 2. Introduce the redox half equation for the reduction of the nitrate ion in acidified solution to form nitrogen monoxide and water. So we know we're having the starting with the NO3 minus ion and we're going to form nitrogen monoxide. At this point, I wouldn't actually add water in because I, I mean, you're going to have to, but. Um, anything like this, write down the general species um, that are being oxidized or being reduced in this case. So we've got, it's being reduced in this case, I've said that as if I, it's, yeah, reduced in this case, yeah. So, now of course, yeah, it says reduction there. Uh, balance this up, nitrogen's are balanced, that's fine. Oxygen's are not balanced, I've got three there, I've got one there, therefore I need three more. So I'm gonna add three waters on no I'm not oh, I tell you sloppiness over here I've seen three and I've been I've been puzzled by it two water so I've got one two three now on that side obviously I've unbalanced it and I've now got four hydrogens here so we balance that with uh, hydrogen ions there finally we balance the charge zero charge this side currently I've got a charge of three plus so I add three electrons and that balance is now charge wise. So nitrogen's equal, oxygen's equal, hydrogen's equal, charge is equal. Deduce the redox half equation for the oxidation of the sulfide ion in aqueous solution to form the sulfate ion and H plus ions. <laughs> Key thing here um, we're told it's copper 2 sulfide uh, and we know that it's CUS. Therefore, if copper is 2 plus and the overall thing is CUS. S must be two minus. Bit of, bit of a detective work there. Oxidation to the sulfate ion. So this time we're going to SO four two minus. Balance up as before. Sulfurs are balanced. Check. We do want to add four this time. Four waters on that side. Again, hydrogen is now unbalanced. So we do this side. We add eight H plus. Balance the charges, we'll two there, two there. 
how we're going to balance that. Let's have a look. I'm confusing myself now. Uh, yeah, we just need to cancel this. There we go. So that cancelled these out. Charges minus two on each side. Hydrogens, oxygens, and all the rest are all balanced up. Not particularly high of scoring questions there, uh, but still a chance to grab some sort of not too difficult marks. <laughs> Four marker here. Got a lot of space for that. Use your knowledge of metal reactivity to state and explain a low cost method for extraction of copper from a dilute aqueous solution of copper 2 sulfate. Write the simplest ionic equation for the reaction that occurs during this extraction process. Right. So, uh, one way is to extract using scrap iron. So, we. It's, so, explaining. So, state and explain. So, use scrap iron. Why? Well, iron more <laughs> reactive than copper. <laughs> Therefore, obviously, it will, it will, it will ultimately uh, displace it. Um, four marks. What's the other one going to be for? You scrap iron. Iron more. Um, and yeah, sorry, miles weather drifted off. Um, therefore, displaces the copper. So this is the iron displaces the copper. Uh, simplest ionic equation. Uh, so we're going to look for. I start with my copper ions. Well, it doesn't matter either way really. Iron, and it's directly just a just a change really. Um, We've got the electrons going from one to the other there. It's quite a quite a nice one. <laughs> Nine marks. Not too bad. Uh, we're on question four of eleven. Uh, so we've still got a way to go. Uh, and I'd guess that again, compared to questions one and two, we're looking for sort of reasonably short scoring uh, questions at this point. Ah, mechanisms again. So haloalkanes are used in synthesis of organic compounds. Blah, 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 blah. We're looking at this. We've got a reaction of... Haloalkane with potassium hydroxide. Oh, you already go, sorry. Name of mechanism. Well, the mechanism is going to be an elimination. And I know that because I'm going for my haloalkane and I'm going to an alkene uh, via the reaction with my hydroxide. I like this reaction. It's like a waterfall, I always think. So, draw your starting point here. So, CH3, so H3C. CH BR CH 3, I think that's right, isn't it? It's 1, 2, 3. Yes, potassium hydroxide. Good. So, what I'm going to end up with is I'm going to end up with a double bond here. <coughs> so, basically, I've got to attack this hydrogen. So, the OH minus ions are going to attack this hydrogen. We're going to get from the bond onto the bond, yeah? uh, and then we're going to get this ejection of the bromine. So it's the adjacent hydrogen. It's the hydrogen attached to the carbon that is adjacent to the carbon where the halogen is attached. Yeah. Nice little point there. That's actually all your marks so one two three and name there four fairly simple marks really key thing is making sure you don't attack the wrong hydrogen because you could attack this one but we end up with a double bond here which of course would be wrong it's not what the question is telling you door the displayed isomer for the other isomer that is formed well it's unbelievable it's like I'm it's like I'm, I know the questions here that's exactly what I've just say displayed means all bonds shown uh, displayed formula then, so we remember what we had before CH, and there was a CH, two CH3s, so two carbon, carbon. Hold on a minute, I feel like I've missed. Oh, yeah, I have. Shoot. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's fine. So that was that is the idea here. Is this is formed 
um, if we had the attack occurring to this one. Still same ejection, but obviously the we would ultimately end up with a double bond there, not there, which is the other isomer. State this type of structural isomerism straight away, boom. Positional. We've gone from position on the uh, first carbon here to a position on the s or second carbon, depending on which way around you look at it. So, positional isomerism, nice. A small amount of another organic compound X can be detected in the reaction with mixture form when a hot concentrated ethanol of potassium hydroxide reacts with 2 bromo 3 methyl butane. So. Okay, so we are forming. Right, we're also forming the alcohol. That's the key thing here. We're also forming the alcohol. We've got a substitution reaction going on. So the substitution reaction here is going to be switching out basically that bromine there. So it's the same molecule before. Displayed formula, so we've got to draw it. Oh, this is killing me. Oh, I think I missed actually last time. Oh, no, I didn't. I drew it. Oh, I remember drawing that. Uh, CHC, another CH3. So much methyl. Uh, and C. H, I'm to get myself confused now. O, H, C, H, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh no, I've added a, another carbon in somewhere. I don't know where. Oh no, that's yeah. I'll tell him I'm having an absolute stinker here. Absolute stinker. Tell you what, I've had enough of this. Let's try that again. So, draw my methyl groups. I thought there was a lot of methyl groups there. Uh, I've drawn my methyl group, so I've got my hydrogens. Carbon here, that's going to be where my oxygen is attached. Uh, hydrogen. Wasting precious time. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. C5H12O is a secondary alcohol, uh, which is one alcohol group here, another alkyl group here, so therefore I've got a secondary alcohol. So just one change to the reaction conditions that would increase the yield of X. <laughs> so. We're told, if you look at the top here, very cleverly, where are we? Hot, concentrated ethanol. Uh, that favours elimination, so let's just do something different. Let's do uh, colder or less concentrated uh, in water, because it's ethanolic, it's the other one. There you go. So basically just making the opposite of those. You've got three options. You could do it colder, you could do it uh, with water rather than ethanol as the solvent, and you could do it um, with less concentrated uh, potassium hydroxide. So the time mechanism of the conversion of 2-bromo-3-methylbutane into X. Well, that was uh, the delight that is nucleophilic. So you're not drawing the actual mechanism itself, um, but it's quite a... <laughs> It's obviously, you're expected to be able to realise it, certainly. Um, so, identify one feature of this infrared spectrum right here of a pure sample of X that may be used to confirm that X is an alcohol. Straight away, I've done enough of these where I know that this right here, ding, this is what we're looking for here. That right there, and it's about getting the right sort of um, range here. Um, and that's, the, you just basically take that off from the data sheet. So, the data sheet's got three, two, 33550 um, uh, essentially is what's the question asking us? Yeah, so peak peak in the range of those two um, is is the the feature that basically tells us we've got an alcohol because that is the feature of the OH group from an alcohol that is obviously not a carboxylic acid that's the OH group from an alcohol which is giving us this broad peak right here you've got to give the details though you've got to use the data sheet and you've actually I said you may find it helpful you probably gonna need to unless you want to read it off the graph use it in the data sheet um, stick your values down and it's that peak in the range and that's really what they're looking for nice easy one mark there hopefully no more analysis actually um, stuff in the rest of this paper so we're on question six now we're doing good time we are 34 minutes in <laughs> Uh, we've I don't know how many marks we've done. It'd be good to be able to do this in the hour. Would be nice. So, question six: Chlorine displaces iodine. Another halogens question. Chlorine displaces iodine from aqueous potassium iodide. 
uh, write the simplest ionic equation for this reaction. So chlorine, so I've got to include chlorine there, obviously, displaces iodine from aqueous potassium iodide. So we're going to react it with iodide. Uh, we're ultimately going to produce iodine uh, because we're switching that bad boy around. And we're going to produce the Cl minus. We've got to balance this up. Uh, either way, really, I'd probably go to. Oh, God. And two. Yeah. To give one observation you would make when this reaction occurs. Um, iodine solution. We're producing iodine, so solution uh, turns brown. We'll call it brown, orange, red. Ready brownie, it's not really very orange at all, is it? That's very, that's bromine water. Brownie red, that's sort of real dark um, colour, not bright, it's a darkish colour. You've seen it in testing for potatoes in biology and things to see if you've got. No, that's starch, isn't it? No, yeah, no, yeah, it changes colour, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, 6b. In bright sunlight, chlorine reacts with water to form oxygen as one of the products. Write an equation for this reaction. So chlorine reacts with water. So straight away, boom. Chlorine reacts with water to form oxygen as one of the products. Uh, write an equation for this reaction. I don't know if you want to form that. Right, the other thing here is going to be HCl then. Have to balance this up. Um, what we're going to have to do, so we've got two there, right number four, and there's two there I believe, <laughs> a reasonably straightforward mark, another one there, if you're not happy with the equations you've only got to have lost a couple of marks really in this question, on this paper so far, besides ionic equations I'm assuming that you can do those, some of these are a bit sort of coming, um, uh, coming out of the blue a little bit I guess, um, but you know, it's not too bad, not too bad, uh, right so explain why chlorine has a lower boiling point than bromine. So, stra straight away we're thinking boiling point, I'm thinking instantly intermolecular forces, which again there is a video on, please watch it. Um, so intermolecular forces, and I'm thinking iodine, I'm thinking, not iodine, bromine and chlorine, there's no permanent dipoles, so I'm thinking van der Waals straight away, so I'm going to at some point talk about van der Waals maybe, uh, we'll see what we get on that. But why would it have a lower boiling point than bromine? Well. For a start, chlorine is smaller. Notice here it's comparing, so our answer has to be comparative. Smaller, not it's small, it's smaller than bromine. It's a fairly good start, I like that. Um, and therefore, think about boiling, really, our molecule here, both diatomic molecules. It's the forces between these molecules which, which are being overcome. So forces between, that would be just be van der Waals, between chlorine molecules is weaker. Because it has a lower boiling point, therefore a less energy is required to break those bonds or overcome those forces, whatever you want to say. <laughs> Therefore, they must be, of course, be weaker. Five marker again. So, again, like I said, not very long questions. We're on to question seven. I like this because this isn't one you can just basically bust out. Straight away, I'm seeing in terms of initiation, first propagation, and second propagation. Um, note that it's for chlorine, not bromine or anything else. Sometimes they put in bromine, it tricks people out. Initiation step is always the formation of the radical. So, Cl2 is going to 2Cl dot there. First propagation is when the radical gets involved, has a great time, and it reacts with, in this case, reaction of CH3Cl. So we're going to form a dichloromethane uh, there. So CH3Cl is the next bit, reaction straight away. That forms as that funny radical now. We lose the hydrogen, and in doing so we produce hydrogen chloride. Second propagation step. It's this guy now. It's always a radical that's doing a bit of a bit of reacting, so we'll stick that first. Note that I've got the dot on the carbon. It needs to be in the correct place. Put it in the wrong place, you're going to lose the mark. Chlorine's involved again, this time as a molecule, not as a radical. And we produce what we want, which is CH2Cl2. And, of course, a chlorine radical again, which can go around and blank. Termination step. That forms a compound with empirical form of CH2Cl. So we need to react two things that will form that. Ah, the empirical formula. See, that's a very clever question, that. So what we could find is that CH2Cl reacting with CH2Cl 
would give us CH2, CL, CH2, CL, which of course empirical formula wise would just be CH2, CL. I said that word, that CH2, CL came up a lot just then. So, um, I feel like something's missing here. Maybe an arrow? Put an arrow in there. Um, so that one hopefully is all right for reasonably straightforward marks. Name the type of reactive intermediate that acts as a catalyst in this uh, particular reaction here. Uh, carbon chlorine bonds are broken, so it's going to be the intermediate. And it's the same principles here. You see those in propagation steps. The chlorine acts as, or the chlorine radical acts as a cheeky little catalyst there. Right, two equations show this intermediate is evolved as a catalyst in the decomposition of ozone. So it's the same principle as before. Chlorine's going to start, and chlorine's ultimately going to going to be part of the end game. There he is. Um, so it de decomposes ozone, so of course we've got to react with ozone. I'm going to sneeze. No, I'm not. Oh, it's gone. That's a killer. Uh, we're going to form CLO. Little dotty thing there. Very nice. So it reacts and of course kicks out um, O2 there. CLO uh, is going to react with O3, this is kind of one of those, it's really it's a good idea just to sort of learn. Uh, I'm going to get 202 there. And so it's a similar concept <coughs> to the <coughs> propagation step here where the chlorine radical reacts and basically jumps on board uh, and just and just robs some stuff, um, forming the, in this case, the radical there. In this case, slightly different in that we form that radical where the chlorine is now part of it. So it's few differences there. It's it's one of those you are sort of just really need to kind of learn. It's it's a, it's a very much an application of the um, the free radical substitution stuff. Seven marks, fairly straightforward on question seven. <laughs> We're 41 minutes in. I'm hoping that we can finish by an hour. Uh, so in each of the following questions, you should draw the structure of the compound in the space provided. Draw the structure of the alkene that would form 1,2-dibromo-3-methylbutane when reacted with bromine. So. Alkene, one two dibromo. So straight away I'm thinking, well, first and second carbons, uh, three methyl, <coughs> butane. So, yeah, it's got to be like this, doesn't it? I would hope. Add the bromine on there, boom, one there, one there would give us one, two, dibromo, three methyl, butane. Right, yep, that's all right, I'll deal with that. Um, yep, <laughs> draw the structure of an alcohol with the molecular form of C4H10O that is resistant to oxidation by cis -fine. Okay, it doesn't get oxidized, it's got to be a tertiary alcohol, so I know for a start that my carbon at the central point here. I'm just going to put these on and see where I'm at. 1, 2, 3, C... 1, 2, 3, 2, yeah. two Yes, that's going to be fine. Yes, yeah, so we've got a tertiary structure here. 1, 2, 3, alcohol groups. C4, H10O, C4, H10O. Boom, lovely. Draw the structure of an alkene that has a peak due to its molecular ion, MZ42, in its mass spectrum. Here we assume that Z is plus 1, so M is basically equal to 42 so it's MR equals 42 so an alkene that has uh, an MR of 42 well let's have a think so we've got C <laughs> 12 24 uh, 36 we can't read more carbons uh, 1 2 3 4 5 6 well 36 out of 6 straight away nailed it it's propane uh, I'm not need to name any of these by the way we're just just drawing them uh, and finally, four mark question. What's even the point of that? Draw the structure of the organic compound, organic product with MR73 made from the reaction between 2 bromobutane and ammonia. Excellent. I mean, in this kind of question, if you want to stick down the actual um, a bit of a reaction, you know, you're more than welcome to. So initially it would have been bromine on there, but when the ammonia comes in, it's like zero, a razor, disappeared, and we end up forming this amine bit there so those bonds are still going to remain 12 24 36 48 
50, 52, 53, 55, 57 on that bit there, uh, 71, 73. Now obviously hydrogen's all around here, and all around there, I'm not going to do it, I'm trying to save time. In fact, you know I'm going to do it, because that's it's cheating if not, isn't it? No one wants a cheater. H, they're, they're getting sloppy if we're honest. Make yours clearer than this. Mm. Going down. More alkenes, I love alkenes. <laughs> The alkene E, but 2 in nitrile is used to make acrylic plastics. You look at that and you go, oh, no, no, it is. But actually, it's given to you, so it's fairly easy. So it's an E format because our biggest, uh, highest priority groups, whatever you want to call it, are across from each other. E, Entgegen, is what I'm told it stands for. Might be wrong. Uh, let's draw it for Z. Well, switch these two. That's all we're going to do. So we're going to go CN, H. For some reason, I'm working backwards. That feels really odd and an H down there lovely jubbly it's a nice reasonable one hopefully um, next question identify the feature of the double bond in the E and Z isomers that cause them to be stereoisomers straight away it's just going that there's restricted rotation um, around a carbon carbon double bond and what that means is that if this was a single bond it wouldn't matter if these, what position these two are in, because actually turning it around, this, the, the bond can rotate and it would be the same. That restricted rotation means it cannot. They are two different uh, molecules, these. Um, this will have slightly different properties as a, as a result. <laughs> Draw the repeating unit of the polyalkene. Oh. <laughs> Formed by addition polymerization of e but 2 e nitrile. Brilliant. Easiest way here is to actually imagine it's the E format we're using, so it's this one, so CH3. Imagine it was written out like this, um, as opposed to being written out the other way. What you're going to do is you're going to break that, and you're going to do the trailing bonds. Um, it's just asking for the repeating unit, so we don't have to worry about any ends and all the rest of it. We're not, we don't need those at all, um, because it's not asking for the reaction, it's asking for what is the repeating unit itself. So if I can remember what that was, CH3, C... Oh, that was a bit weird. Uh, H, C, H, C, N. That's it. One mark. Fairly, fairly straightforward. Sticking with the E structure ultimately. Um, but with the, with the bonds all correct, having broken the double bond, that's very, very important. Oh, more infrared spectra. So, infrared spectrum of E butyl nitrile is, is given there. So, there are two. So, what two features support that it is? Bute 2 e nitrile. What well, I'm thinking straight away. Um, this nitrile group. Looking at you, you're looking at your, your basically your data sheet. Feature one is going to be something from 2220 to 2260, and that's going to be our CN group. Uh, or we could have down here 1620 to 1680, uh, and that's going to be the carbon-carbon double bond. So and those peaks in those regions and that's that's supported on here as well I'm not spend a lot of detail and a lot of time on those just very much sort of reading your data sheet uh, question 10 we're almost there and we are 48 minutes 12 minutes left probably about to do this okay so ethanol is an important industrial compound ethanol can be produced by the hydration of ethene this is the equation that we're given an enthalpy change i'm thinking what we're going to do here um I can't remember actually here whether there should be a <coughs> put that in possibly or are we thinking is it gonna be <coughs> no it's gonna be on this question I'm not sure why it's disappeared all honestly it's gonna be one of these guys isn't it so um, identify the catalyst used in this process. Just one of those you need to know. Uh, you've got a choice of con concentrated, concentrated uh, phosphoric acid, or it could be concentrated uh, sulfuric. Very important you have concentrated implied there or written down. Deduce how an overall yield of 95% is achieved in this process without changing the operating conditions. Or oh, how could we change? Um, without change operations, how can we get an overall year of 95%? Right, so what you can do, um, 
So we know that th this, at these conditions there, conversion of ethene into ethanol is 5%, so we're left with a lot more ethene. So what we can do is we just repump it round then. Um, so we'll recycle the ethene, unused ethene. And if you carry this reaction out enough times, although it's only 5%, if you do it enough and enough and you keep doing you keep doing, that's ultimately going to go up and you're going to end up with a 95% yield, which is apparently what happens. Use your knowledge of equilibrium projections to state why a manufacturer might consider using an excess of steam in this process. Use it under the same operating conditions. Why would they use an excess of steam? So, steam is water. So, if we ramp up the amount of water in there, or the amount of steam, it's going to, the reaction is going to look to actually decrease that, and the only way it can do that is by for, favouring the forward reaction. And so if it favours the forward reaction, or it shifts to the right direction, and we would find the yield of uh, ethanol is going to increase. So, um, hmm, how am I going to word this? Um, equilibrium position shifts right that's an arrow it's a terrible arrow oh there you go shifts to the right um and what's the rest of the question use your knowledge of an equilibrium extraction to explain why manufacturer marks are using excess of steam this process under the same operations so what happens so the equilibrium position shifts to the right um and what does this do well it decreases uh, amount of steam um, yield of ethanol increases so we're using those ideas we're basically applying them to that, that to the content this this case we're using that equilibrium same as actually kind of in question one really there's not a lot of differences it's just a slightly different obviously a different situation because a different uh, different equation 10a part 3 are oh, still going wow so pressure is higher than 7 megapascal some of the ethene reacts to form a solid with a relative molecular mass greater than 5000 straight away we're just thinking right what's going to be formed in identify this solid it's going to be polyethene we're going to find polymerization is going to occur which is absolutely fine obviously not particularly useful if you want to make loads of ethanol because you've now got plastic everywhere which isn't going to be very useful if we could just pick it out and do whatever ethanol -y plastic give one other reason for not operating this process at higher pressures higher than seven megapascals do not include safety reasons well i'm going to go cost then um cost of pumping is one they quite like uh makes it expensive or another one which is quite nice is um cost of equipment um, that can stand high pressure <laughs> another two delightful marks write an equation for the reaction that has an enthalpy change that is the standard enthalpy formation of ethanol right so definition of standard enthalpy formation is the enthalpy change when one mole of product is formed from its elements and their constituent states and all the rest of it. So we know we're going to form ethanol, so C25OH. What's it formed from? Well, carbon, and oxygen, and hydrogen. We need state symbols there. Um, so we've got a liquid here, L, gas, gas, solid. Very, very important. So to balance this up we can't change this one mole is formed that's incredibly important in this in this definition it's one mole is produced so that cannot change so i've got six hydrogen so i'm going to get three there i've got one oxygen so i'm going to halve that and i've got two there that looks okay to me uh when ethanol is used as a fuel it undergoes combustion to find this term standard for combustion three marks wow so enthyl p change when one mole of a substance yeah it's a substance a compound either one uh, is burned completely in oxygen 
um, all reactants with all reactants again this is just a direct sort of regurgitation of knowledge all reactants and products in standard states three marks delicious luckily question 10 continues on the next page I would hate if it didn't. Uh, bond enthalpies, I like these ones here. Bond enthalpies, so consider these bond enthalpy data. Uh, use the data in the equation to calculate the value for the enthalpy of combustion of gaseous ethanol. So, I think it's always useful to draw out actually what you're dealing with. Uh, otherwise, you're going to find it a little bit confusing potentially. CH3, CH2, OH. With any of these, what I do is I work out the energy required to break all the bonds and then I do the energy that would be released when all the other, these bonds are made. So I break all these, so this is all just atoms and then I remake them to form here. And so I would say here that we have uh, what we've got uh, CH3 so where we are question wise CH3, so we've got three carbon hydrogen bonds there, so one, two, three for five, five times CH, uh, we've got one times CC. These are all broken. Uh, we've got one times CO, and we've got one times OH. Now, add on to that three times OO. <coughs> Over here, we are going to make one, two times two, so four. COs and we're going to make one, two times three, six OH bonds. So we total all that up and we go -ling 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 -ling, uh, and we come out with values of um, I think we're looking at something like 4,719 and 5 This, um, what I would say is just add these values together, but make sure you stick a minus on this one because this is energy that's been released. It's an exothermic process. You add these together, they come up with a value of minus 1279 kilojoules per mole. Gases ethanol can be used to convert hot copper oxide into copper to use the role of ethanol in this reaction hot copper oxide into copper. So we're turning the copper to here, the two is a giveaway, copper ions essentially being turned into copper. Uh, so we're going for Cu2 plus to Cu, therefore 2 plus to 0. Ethanol is going to be reducing, so it's reductionizing, reducing. Draw the structure of the organic compound with an MR of 60 that's produced in this reaction. So... Have a look what we're doing. So ethanol. The reduction. I don't know why we're in reduction. It's reducing agent. Like that's terrible. At least I'm realising my mistakes. Reducing agent. So reducing agent is itself oxidised. So ethanol is going to be oxidised. We should be thinking. I mean, again, time back now into the alcohol stuff. We can add, oh, we can oh God, we can oxidise an alcohol into uh, an aldehyde or a ketone. I just happen to know that uh, if we oxidise this to CH3COOH, that would have the MR of 60. Draw the structure, um, so stick it like that, or I'd go for actually a drawn out one here. Um, COOH, CH3COOH, lovely. Last question. Uh, oh, I like this. Group two metals in the compounds are used commercially in a variety of processes. Strontium is extracted from strontium oxide by heating a mixture of powder, strontium oxide, and powder aluminium. Okay, so we're giving some uh, enthalpies of formation, and we're given a reaction here, and we're going to have to do some sort of cycle. Five marks, oh my lord. Lots to write here. So, last question of the paper, the hardest one. So, we're looking to calculate that enthalpy change there. Okay, so we need to have formation data, so I'm just going to, because I'm too lazy. And I would guess if we were looking, obviously, we're going to have formation data for the strontium oxide and for the aluminium oxide, okay? Without worrying about the stuff that we've got at the bottom here, so it doesn't really matter what you put this sort of magical box down here. Um, 
it's more really important that you have the uh, the rest of it sorted. Um, the enthalpy change for forming strontium oxide of this is minus 590 this is minus 1669 going from what would just be the elements at the bottom here so if we were being picky with that we could say 3SR uh, plus 2AL plus one and a half O two. That's everything, yeah. Yeah. So we want this enthalpy change go from here to here. So we want to start here ideally. We want to finish here. We can't go from here to here. So we go around the houses, we go right round there instead. If you go with an arrow you keep the value. If you go against it, you reverse the symbol. So this ends up being plus five ninety added to minus sixteen sixty nine. Uh, we come out with a value of, uh, oh hold on, almost made an absolute schoolboy there didn't I, looking up here, oh, I tell you I can't believe I made that mistake, absolutely gutted at that, three strontium oxide here, um, the enthalpy formation here, if you think about the definition is the energy required to form one mole, but we're not forming three moles, this is actually three times that, so three three times 590 added to this minus 1669 I'm going to come out with a value of 101 kilojoules per mole it's getting late I had a busy day busy day of paintballing so this is missed out on my three absolute scoreboy there don't miss out on silly things like that though it will cost you dearly um, that's our first bit done so the use of powder strontium oxide and powdered aluminium increases the surface area of this reactant suggests one reason why this increases the reaction rate um, ultimately you've got more collisions so uh, more frequent um, collisions um, <coughs> therefore I'd say which you don't need to do but I would anyway uh, more chance of successful collisions therefore just by just by chance so that's this mark here done it's just one major reason why this method of extracting strontium is expensive um, well we're reacting with pure aluminium it's aluminium's not cheap at all you know, aluminium the cost of aluminium is expensive um, the reason being that it's you know it's the extraction of aluminium via electrolysis is is a very expensive process due to electricity. So extraction by electrolysis is expensive. Um and we don't just want to be can't just be throwing away aluminium just reacting here and there to get a bit of strontium when we want it. So that's that done. Um question eleven does continue, which I'm glad about must be finished oh, almost there and well I think we've just gone over the hour explain why calcium has a higher melting point than strontium so this is a question um, when you're looking really uh, at its position in the uh, periodic table and now for the life of me I can't remember where strontium is um, trying to think in now strontium calcium I haven't got a periodic table on me which is annoying um, okay yeah that's fine so calcium is smaller or calcium ion is smaller and again it's comparative than strontium ion that means that the outer shell electrons are closer to nucleus that means the attraction is greater that means that the bonding the metallic bonding I should say is stronger you don't actually need that much detail the answer is actually a lot you can put less than that but I just think it's nice sometimes to write an answer they give you some space it's only two marks but you know put the stuff down that you know it's not actually a lot more difficult to write all this uh, at least then you're covering all the sort of the bases of, of various bits and pieces Final question. Magnesium is used in fireworks. It reacts rapidly with oxygen, burning with a bright white light. Magnesium reacts slowly with cold water. Write an equation. Honestly, this is the last question on an AS level paper. Uh, magnesium plus oxygen 
goes to magnesium oxide. <laughs> Balance it up. That's a mark somehow. Write an equation in the reaction of magnesium with cold water. Magnesium plus H2O. In this case, we form a hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, uh, and or water. Balance that up. Uh, that's four hydrogens, two oxygens. Good. Uh, we've done that. We've done that. Give a medical use for the magnesium compound formed in the reaction of magnesium with cold water. So, this is one of those funny things. Magnesium hydroxide uh, can be used as an antacid or indigestion tablets if you want um, because of its um, uh, hold on, I'm trying to write words and speak uh, because of the fact that it's not very soluble really so that is it done that is all 100 marks of a unit 2 paper done in just about an hour it's gone through quite quickly it's again as I said it's not the aim isn't it? to teach you each of the each of the topics there it's just to show you the general sort of a way of answering the questions and sort of the way you look at it. Hopefully that's been of some use. Uh, by all means, let me let me know if not or if there's any changes and all the rest of it. But yeah, I hope that's helpful.